Yes. Greetings. My name is Jean Helms, and I am the Administrative Director of the Unitarian Church. And I'm here today with Monica Zinke from Fresh Start. And uh, this month, we are featuring Fresh Start as the Share the Plate recipient, which means that um, normally one Sunday a month, we take an offering, which we give to our Share the Plate organization. However, during the pandemic, what we've been doing is running that um, share the plate for the entire month. So you can send in a contribution anytime in the month of, month of February that will um, go directly to Fresh Start to benefit them and their um, services. And so I'm going to let Monica introduce herself and tell us more about their work. Hi, well, I'm Monica Zinke, as Jean said, and I'm the executive director of Fresh Start. And as many of you know, because the Unitarians are full of friends of ours, um, but Fresh Start is a transitional program for women experiencing homelessness, and they can be homeless for any reason. So we're really kind of a catch-all for the Lincoln community for women that don't have children with them and that are homeless for any reason. And they can come and live in with us for up to a year. So it gives them more time to really settle in and not and take a breath. <laughs> There's a lot of women that come here and they're not sure where to start, but they still are so used to having to just try and get everything done in a month or in 90 days so that they can move out of where they are. So uh, the year stay really just gives them time to settle in and take a breath and hopefully do first things first, you know, address the health concern before they look for their next job or things like that. Um, and so that's really sh in, a, in a nutshell what we do um, here at Fresh Start. Um, what, what has it been like for you the last year or two? Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's been, it's been hard during the pandemic. It's been hard on all of us individually. It's been hard on us as a program. It's been hard on us as a community. Um, but our program is a case management program and it's really built on relationships and it's, it's just a struggle to do that when you're trying to stay six, six feet away from people. It's a struggle to do that when we have to say, oh, we're not having any workshops for a while because we, we don't want to bring in outside people or we don't want you to have to gather as a group. So it has been a struggle for us at the shelter. Um, we are also seeing women that it's taking longer to save some money for the next place because their hours might be all over the place or it may be harder to find a job or just like a lot of us, maybe they're anxious about getting the job that's available that has a lot of contact with the public and with people. So it's it's been stressful in a lot of ways. Um, we've made some different accommodations for our program. We're letting people stay a little longer than a year if they need to. Um, we've had a couple of people do that um, because it's harder to get that apartment and harder to save up, like I said. Um, We've reduced our occupancy so that we have room set aside for quarantine because otherwise they'd have to leave if they got sick and then come back when they were better. And we don't want to do that. We want them to be able to stay here when it's their home. So, so we have fewer people staying during the pandemic so that we can have that space set aside for them if they need it. So um, that means our wait list is longer. So it all, it all has a snowball effect with some of these things. So it's been a rough couple of years. Um, I will say, though, that through it all, we have so much gratitude for the support that we've received because we have a lot of supporters, including ones from, from the UU congregation, that reach out and say, can we still bring the supper? Can we, what can we do? Are you short on anything? Do you need some crafts for the residents? Do you need, you know, so people really reaching out to us as an organization with contributions of items or funds, but also reaching out to say, how can we support really your core mission beyond just, you know, a check beyond, beyond that. And, and that really shows us how much people care about what we do and care about all the women that are here. And so we've, we've remained full of gratitude through it for that purpose. Yeah. Right. You, well, you answered one of my questions, which was about capacity. Um, and I understand, of course, the reasons for needing quarantine space. Mm -hmm. Um, without, you know, sharing something that, you know, is private information, what is, what is the, um, deal with the waiting list? I mean, I'm assuming that that means that the waiting list is longer now than it, it had been in the past, but how long do folks normally wait? What's the average amount of time that they wait before they can get in or typically the wait list 
sometimes it's sometimes it's as short as a month. Usually it's one to three months. And it was getting longer than that. And it's actually probably back to close to that, but it's because people hear about how long the wait list is and a lot of people then don't apply. Okay. So it doesn't really indicate the need because they're like, well, I need a place in two weeks. I need a place. Right. In. So, um, so a lot of times they don't apply when they hear that it's a longer wait. Um, so one to three months, we had started to, we're, we're right around 16, 16 to 18 right now out of our 24 um, capacity. And we had started to move that back up and then the risk dial went right. back up. So now we're staying around 16 to 18. And when people call us, we're trying to give them referrals to places that might work or might have openings right now. We don't just you know, say, no, it's three months. We still try and work with them a little bit, um, but there's just not a whole lot of options. And some programs are requiring negative tests or requiring vaccines, which is understandable that for a lot of our population, you can't get a drive-through test if you don't have a car. So, um, sure. so there's some, some barriers like that for, for people as well that we're trying to manage with the ones that can come into Fresh Start when it's their, their turn. But um, yeah, we're right around 16 right now out of our 24 okay. opening. I do, actually recommended that shelters go down to 50% and we didn't want to go all the way down to 12. Um, so that's why we we're trying to balance the, the recommendations we get with the need in the community. And that's where we've been around 16. Sure. Um, and I, I think I understand that the type of program that you have is just for women who are solo they don't bring their kids there are other shelters in lincoln where there are places where they can have their kids with them correct yes mm -hmm. ours is for women that don't have children with them so typically about 50 percent of them are moms their, their kids might be all grown up uh, and it's their grandkids that visit them you know when we're not in a pandemic <laughs> um but ours is for women that don't have the kids with them we have some that the kids are living with a relative um, or, or we have some that are in CPS custody, but it's actually just as common or more common that they're with another relative than that there's state involvement. Um, we have two residents right now that are pregnant, um, but it's just that they're not seeking a program for a family unit. They're seeking a program for just them at the time. So we do a lot of work to make families stronger through the mom, but not through having the kids here on site. The other thing I feel like makes um, Fresh Start a little different is that um, women come there for a variety of different reasons. Uh -huh. So it's not solely, uh, there's programs in Lincoln that are specifically for substance abuse programs or specifically for um, women that are escaping an abusive household. Mm -hmm. I think it's broader than that, right? There's a variety of reasons why women come to Fresh Start. It is, and that was one of our, one of our founding tenants. When, when the group of people started us, including Eleanor Anderson, including Reverend Charles, um, they looked around and there were programs. It's kind of loosened up, but back then in 1991, there were not very many programs for women without kids that weren't real specific. Like this one's only domestic violence, this one's only substance abuse, this mm -hmm. one's mental health. Um, so they really founded us based on no kids because the women typically have to wait longer for services when you don't have kids. That's why it's a year. And on the fact that we're that catch-all, that it's any reason of homelessness. And we still see that need. So we haven't changed our, our target population. We haven't changed our mission because we still see the need for any reason of homelessness and for women without children. Um, but you're exactly right. It was for any any cause, which it's sometimes a challenge because we don't have one model that we're using, like one best practice, because we do have women here. Substance abuse is the biggest thing that they report to us. Mental health, physical health, domestic violence, um, reentry. We have a lot of women that come to us out of incarceration or in some kind of diversion program. So we kind of pick pieces of different models to try and best serve everybody that's here. Great. For those of uh, that might be watching this later, um, can you talk a little bit more about your background? Maybe um, how long you've been with Fresh Start or what, what attracted you? Sure. 
Well, I've been at Fresh Start since 2008, so a while now. And um, I was really interested in Fresh Start. I, I wasn't actually actively looking for a different job at the time, but several people sent me the posting. And I was really interested in it because of its type of program, because of its kind of that niche population. And when I had been living in Texas, I worked at a shelter that had a similar program, had a transitional program that was specifically for women without children. And then it was, it was a huge place. So it also had one for families and one for single men. So it was something that I'd been around before and worked in before um, and knew the value of that and knew the need for that and was assuming that there was a need for that here in, in Lincoln as well, just like where that was. Um, my background is, is a lot of social services. Um, I, I don't do it currently, but I came to Fresh Start after working as a therapist and with foster care. Um, I've done a lot of work with welfare to work programs, with um, emergency services, with disaster services. Uh, so a lot of different kind of positions that all lend themselves to this one since, since we do serve so many different kinds of people and so many different reasons for homelessness my varied background seems to kind of help in that case. So I've been working in social services um, and civic service since 1995. So quite a while. Okay. And this just dawned on me. Um, I hadn't really thought of this before, but are there in, in normal times, let's just say, are there programs or services that you have for some of those outliers that perhaps are waiting to get in or are not homeless, but they still need uh, a leg up? We don't have a specific program for people waiting to, to come in. And what tends to happen is a lot of the women that are coming into our program, they don't have to be referred by another agency, but because our wait list is, ends up being one to three months, they tend to already being, be receiving services. So maybe they're already in inpatient treatment or maybe they're still incarcerated. So, um, so we're talking with them about how to, you know, finish that, be successful with that, and then you can kind of hit the ground running more when you get here. Um, for the ones that are staying with friends or family, we do try and give them some referrals for what they might be needing before they come in, but it's not a real comprehensive program. Okay. When people leave Fresh Start though, um, they can participate in our community support program. And that's essentially like a follow-up program if they want to continue having a case manager come and see them. If um, some of them, depending on their housing voucher for public housing, they might still be required to do case management and we can provide that. Other ones aren't required to be involved in any way, but you know they still might want some support. So okay. quarterly food baskets, home visits from our, our um, community support person. Um, they can still call the shelter 24 hours a day, seven days a week, since we have somebody here 24 hours a day. Um, so we offer some ongoing support when they leave. For a okay. lot of them, for a lot of them, it's kind of a, a big jump from the shelter with constant support to an apartment of their own that seems really quiet. That's what we hear a lot. It's really mm -hmm. quiet here by myself. So we really want to support them as much as they want and as much as we can so that they can be successful when they leave and not get kind of tripped up by things that might be smaller issues but seem so big because because it's new and because they're on their own sure they're not really on their own we're still here for them sure one thing that i often ask too is uh, just for again the benefit of those who may not be as familiar with uh the organization let's talk a little bit about other ways that people can help aside from donating. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is probably to talk a little bit about the DAISY and, and how that works and um, okay. how people find out like where to drop things off or. Well, again, when we're not in a pandemic, <laughs> there's lots of ways to, to help Fresh Start. And one of them is to volunteer. And the DAISY Thrift Shop is our biggest volunteer opportunity has the most volunteers and has a weekly need. So. The thrift shop is normally open on Wednesdays and Thursdays from four to six and on Fridays and Saturdays from 10 to four. Um, and it's all volunteer run. Um, the shop manager is a volunteer, the, every, it's all volunteer run. So it's a wonderful example of what volunteers can do. And so people can sign up for one of those shifts. Um, you don't have to sign up every week. Uh, we encourage people to sign up at least once a month so that everything kind of stays fresh when you're working. But 
Um, and that's a, that's a really great way to help. And the shop, we keep having to close it for the pandemic because we're reducing people coming into the shelter. But before the pandemic, the shop was raising over $40,000 for us. Wow. So it's our biggest fundraiser and it's those volunteers collectively are really making a financial impact on Fresh Start. And they also, I like to think they have an impact on the residents who see these positive role models, who see these strong women coming in, who see that there are people that care about them and are dedicating their time to the shop, which in turn helps Fresh Start and helps their home. So that's our biggest volunteer opportunity. We also sometimes need new members for the board of directors. We have a couple members on the board right now that are members of the church. Um, so that's another way to be involved in a leadership role. Mm -hmm. We do sometimes have volunteers that come in and help with service projects, or when we go back to being able to gather in groups that maybe would offer a workshop for the residents that could be on something job related or could be on a craft or a coping skill. So there's different ways to be involved beyond the financial contribution. There's, there's ways to volunteer and give your time or give, give other items. My favorite non-dollar donation is toilet paper, for example. <laughs> um, because, so there's always things that we need that people sure. can help either with their time or in another way. Sure. So, and again, for those that um, haven't been around long or something, um, I want everyone to know that generally speaking, we do a collection for Fresh Start um, ongoing in the building. And also uh, specifically at Christmas time, uh, we do a, a collect things as part of Stranger Share a Fire. Um, as Monica said, the, the thrift store, the Daisy is, is in the building. So it's at 62nd. 6433 Havelock Avenue. Okay, 64th yeah. and Havelock. Yeah. And so aside from shopping at the thrift store when it is open and it's mm -hmm. safe, um, you can also donate things and find out uh, by calling uh, up the uh, office what drop-off times are. And the other thing I was thinking is that um, we uh, have been, I don't know for how many years now, but they, one of our members started a program where we bring dinner once a month. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that because, you know, to be honest, that's a, that's a specific um, role that we play that I think isn't as visible um, yeah. and that a lot of people not, might not know about. So I don't know if it's just on Sundays, but ours is, uh, the, I think the first Sunday a month um, or, or second Sunday a month, we have a group of people who are organized amongst themselves and they send out an email thread that just um, coordinates the logistics of what they're bringing and yeah. where to drop it off. Um, and I know because I have participated a few times and heard from others as well, that that is just a really, um, it's a wonderful way of participating on a specific level and in a specific way. So if you like to cook or if you just want to be able to um, interact with some other members and friends here and also with the residents um, they non-pandemic times uh, yeah. what they do is bring the the food and then stay and have the meal um, as many people as are up as possible um, stay and have a meal with um, the residents and I think that's a really cool way of it um, of net of networking but you know what I'm saying like getting to know the people on a more intimate level, um, not just here's, here's some money or here's some food, see you later, you know? Um, so I think that's, I think that's a neat thing that you do, um, is involve others in that part. I, I think so too. And it wasn't, it wasn't my idea. Um, it came out of some people asking for a one-time volunteer project that didn't involve yard work or painting <laughs> is how this idea was born. And um, one of our board members at the time suggested providing a meal and it's just on Sundays. The residents rotate cooking and cleaning the other days of the week. So we just did this on Sundays. Um, and it is just like you described a group of people it's it's mostly houses of faith but not always um there's a there's a group there's a couple different groups of women that do it also um and they they provide a meal on sunday and when it's not the pandemic people w could stay and eat with them if they wanted and a lot of the groups didn't and i think partly it's because they 
they didn't know as much about what we did or how to interact compared to the Unitarians who are just so welcoming and and it's all about interconnectedness, right? So right. you just sit down and you share a meal. And so I think it was a more natural thing for the group from this congregation to stay. Um, during the pandemic, people are just dropping off food. Yeah. Um, and it it's a great, it's a great opportunity for people that it's this one-time thing and I can make some not from Nebraska, some cornbread to go with the chili <laughs> or some cinnamon rolls to go with the chili um, and have that and know that you are providing sustenance for the women here at Fresh Start. And it's really, I mean, not to, not to inflate it, but it's really has an impact beyond the food for their body. It, mm -hmm. I think it's food for their soul. I think like like I described with the daisy, knowing that people are doing this because they care about them, even if they don't know them individually, even if they mm -hmm. don't haven't met them, but they care about them being here at Fresh Start and they care about, about them having a hot meal and they care about just them. And this is the way that they're showing it. They're showing it through food, which is right. what so many of us do. I think that has an impact as well. And on that note, they love... They love the second Sunday because you all, you all just bring so many things and there's always, you know, we never know if there's going to be somebody that is vegetarian or vegan or so there's always like a variety of options. Um, and I know the group also purposely makes sure that there's plenty so there can be some for leftovers for lunches and so yeah. The residents, when I come in on Monday are often like oh good there's still some of that soup left, you know. So uh -huh. It is a really bright moment of their day. Um, and when you all would stay to eat, you didn't necessarily see a whole lot of people because people might have been out at a meeting or working or things. And then they come home and they're like, oh, it's Sunday. There's going to be food made and they they look nice. for it. So, yeah, it really has an impact beyond just that one meal. Yeah, I think it's a really cool, cool part of it. And um, it's a way of, I think, of us staying connected with you all, too, during the mm -hmm. year um, where it's not just a once a once a year thing one one month yeah. out of the year where and if we're people want about, to yeah. get involved and the Sundays are full because we we're mostly full I think for the year um that's when we can also say well the regular Sundays are full but do you want to do somebody could sponsor a, a movie night and bring you know popcorn and movie candy and soda or could sponsor it for a holiday that maybe doesn't fall on a Sunday or isn't already covered so so we, we try and still accommodate people because it's great to have that for the residents. So if people are interested in it and you call and they're like, the Sundays are full, just ask for other options because we can figure out something, especially idea. during the pandemic, because there's just not enough bright moments that we can offer them during this time. So, so anything extra people want to do is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, before we close out, the only other thing I um, have on my list is it, if you'd like to share a recent success story i think that it's nice to sort of hear what that transition is like yeah well there's there's so many and some of it is small successes like somebody getting an interview but i'm thinking of somebody that moved out recently that was with us for almost an entire year and she came to us really quiet really not knowing where to start. She came to us with a long history of domestic violence and control and hadn't lived on her own really ever. Um, and, and she's in her fifties. So this is, that's unusual. Hadn't ever had a driver's license, hadn't ever, I mean, because of the way her life was structured and then had some significant losses and grief and left and came to fresh start and really had to figure out who she was and find some confidence and find find herself really is not overstating it and and we see that a lot that they have to kind of find themselves or find themselves again so she was here for a year um these different life situations also meant that she was on uh probation and so she was finishing that out while she was here um she developed a, a support system. She strengthened some, some friendships and relationships that she had. She was able to strengthen those. She built new ones when she was at Fresh Start. And the most exciting thing was, you know, she finished her probation and she did all those things, but she got her driver's license, which was really exciting and made her so confident. And um, we, 
does not happen very often, but we, we were, she was actually gifted with a vehicle from somebody that just wanted to give it to somebody at Fresh Start. Um, and that really gave her a sense of independence, even though she didn't drive very often, knowing that she could, knowing that she could do things really gave her a sense of independence. And when she left here, she actually moved out of state to be closer to some of her other family that she hadn't been around. And the fact that she felt strong enough to do that and confident enough to do that after never having done or been able to do things on her own is just amazing. And she had saved up while she was here. She had saved up enough money that she could do that, that she nice. had a nest egg to take with her um, and get started in that new community with her family without having to just immediately rely on her family. So that was really exciting. Um, and then we have somebody else here that's 19 and really we're hoping that we are part of her journey to start her life out for adult life um, out really strong. Like, how can we help you, you know, when they're that young, do you have your GED? Are you still in high school? What, you know, like it's really starting from scratch because they don't have a history of, of that kind of economic self-sufficiency. So we're helping them deal with their trauma history so that they can start out strong when, as they move to adulthood. So those are kind of two different examples of people recently at the, at the shelter at different, different parts in their journey. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good to hear. I mean, it's, it's, um, I think good for us to know that it's a really wide variety of circumstances mm -hmm. that um, lead to somebody needing, uh, needing to be there. And it's not, uh, it's not something you can pigeonhole. Um, mm -hmm. our, our youngest resident last year was 19. And I think our oldest was 62. Okay. So, um, so we really see people in a lot of different stages. And we're, we're really truly helping them change the trajectory of their lives. And, and I say we, because we don't do it alone here at Fresh Start. We can't do it without, you know, all of you, we can't do it. And we're not even the ones doing it. They're the ones taking those steps every day together with you all. We are just providing that environment where they can feel empowered to do that and feel supported to do that and feel safe to do that. Not just physically safe, but emotionally safe to do that and to, to get back on their feet. So so thank you for being a part You're welcome. of welcome. It's important. Yeah. Well, um, I feel like this has been really a successful interview and, and really great to, to hear from you and, and touch base. Um, I wish we could be in person, uh, but um, as I've been saying to everyone, maybe next year, um, mm -hmm. probably next year, we'll, we'll see you in person and, and not have to have to record things in advance, but i um, I'd like to close by saying that if you would like to give a contribution to Fresh Start, the easiest way to do that is to give through text giving. All you need to do is text UC Lincoln space and the amount to 73256. That's UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. And that information will also be in the chat. Um, as usual, you can also mail a check or give through your online database um, realm. Thank you again for being with us today. And um, I wish you all the best in the in the coming year as we start to, to come out of this very strange time. Hopefully, hopefully we're coming out of it, yes. Yeah.